Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. My name's April Jackson. I am the medical marketing manager for Cabrita. And today we are chatting with Jenny Friedman. She is a registered dietitian, an author, as well as a picky eating expert. And Jenny's a mom too. And she has a, a couple of precious little boys. And if I'm correct me if I'm wrong, but you also have a picky eater, right? You know, he's, yes, he is, he's a toddler, you know, so he eats like a yes. two-year-old. Right, right. Well, and so when it comes to what we're going to cover today, I think this is the perfect opportunity to really um, dive into those conversations about picky eating, um, what uh, we're going to primarily talk about today is is how to navigate those challenges because once we start to introduce foods to toddlers, obviously that comes with its own unique set of challenges. And I love that you focus primarily on addressing those challenges with parents. So I think to start off, let's really just try to define what picky eating is, because I feel like it's this umbrella term, everything under the sun kind of fits under it. And um, it's really important, I think, for people to understand the differences in, in maybe challenges that are out there that, that you work with, that parents may face, um, and that every child is um, an individual. So um, why don't you kind of walk us through what picky sure. eating is? So part of the hard thing about this is that there is no, you know, definitive definition for what picky eating is. There's no, um, you know, you can't open Webster, not that anybody's going back to their, you know, their dictionaries, <laughs> but there's, there's no like, okay, it's this number of foods, it's this behavior, it's starting at this age, none of that. Um, so it's tricky. But what we can say is that kind of what like your pediatrician will probably tell you when they talk about picky eating, when they think about this, is they're thinking about this normal developmental phase that um, now we have, I can't hear the host. <laughs> uh oh. Okay. I hear you fine. All right. Um, so what we, what we see is that there's this normal developmental phase going on where kind of around 18 months, two years of age, there are a bunch of changes happening within your toddler that could contribute to changes in their eating. So we'll see a change in nutritional needs. It's a decrease because they're growing, their growth slows. We'll see an increased independence. So um, a lot of what we're going through is like, I do it myself. I know how to say no, all of that sort of thing. We can also see a change in taste buds. And this is something that some people say like harks back to um, kind of our caveman days where our kids were starting to walk at this point. They were more independent. And so they needed to have some sort of, um, you know, check within themselves to avoid like eating poisonous berries. So that's one reason why we say kids don't like the flavor of bitter foods because those, you know, that's often the flavor of poison. So those kind of things that are going on are what can contribute to the kind of food refusal and like the fickleness of a toddler. Um, and that's what we will think of as, as typical picky eating. It is a phase. It's something they outgrow um, kind of day to day. It can look different in your child. It's not that they always refuse these foods, um, but it's just kind of a, it's a challenge. It becomes, their eating becomes more restricted. Um, they seem to have this, you know, new, very um, discerning palate, and it's very frustrating as a parent. So. Um, right. yeah, that's kind of our best, what we can go for is a kind of our best definition of picky eating. Yeah. And, you know, I, I've done some reading on this topic. I too, uh, I have a, a grown son now, but, but when he was two, right around two, he developed this real aversion to any type of meat. And I won't go into all the details. It was like a little trauma mm -hmm. that occurred for him <clears throat> and, um, and it was a real challenge. Like I never thought of him as being a picky eater. Um, but in my reading, in my own research, 
you know, I've, I read some, some things that, that alluded to, there's so many different levels to the, the picky eating and the challenges that occur to really, um, selective eating, um, and that it's almost like thousands of bad memories or traumas that can be associated with different types of foods or different experiences while learning to eat. Um, and so I think at what point or, or, or when do you consider picky eating to become a more extreme case, a real um, concern nutritionally? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a great and tough question because kind of like that you know, amorphous definition of picky eating, I think it can be different for everybody and there's a bunch of different markers. So one of the things that we can look for would be the extent of time. Like, is the child 10 at this point? Because by 10 years old, they probably should outgrow it. Picky eating should only be lasting for a handful of years. So really by the time we're about six or seven, like they should be, you know, eating more, they should have a greater um, food acceptance. Um, certainly if there is a, an obvious, you know, or like notable nutrition or weight or health implications, so if we're seeing weight loss, nutrient deficiencies, that is definitely a, a very big red flag because even some of the more severe picky eaters or kids with these like more extreme eating challenges won't have an implication on their weight or their, you know, nutritional markers. Um, so those are certainly some red flags. Something that I see a lot is, um, you know, or what I think about is like, to, to what extent is it impacting the child's life or the family's life? You know, my son, it's annoying. It's frustrating. Um, it's inconvenient, but we can go out to eat. He can go to birthday parties. He's growing well. Um, I, you know, like I can basically, be, you know, he, he does everything and it's not, taking over our lives. But a lot of the families who I work with say that this is their child's eating is causing stress for the whole family. It's very disruptive to mealtimes, right. interfering with their child's life or even stressing the child out. The kid says, well, why, how am I going to that birthday party? What am I going to eat there? So for yeah. me, that's a big thing that I see and I think about, and that's obviously different for every family. Another um, thing that you can think about is really what's the number of foods that the child is eating or do they have any big restrictions based on the um, like food type or texture, the excluding entire food groups. So, you know, it's not uncommon for kids to struggle with eating meat, but maybe if a child's not eating any vegetables or they're not eating any proteins, um, that would certainly be you know, a sign of something more extreme going on. Yeah. Yeah. I like on your website, um, uh, you have some pictures on there and, and it's like, this is for the moms and the parents and the dads out there that, you know, are having to pack those safe foods. They're having to really, um, when they're buying groceries, they're buying their children's food separate from like the food the rest of the family will eat. Uh, they're really um, having to make special considerations mm -hmm. to ensure that there's something <clears throat> their child will eat. And I experienced a little bit of that myself. I definitely uh, had a time period with my son where I had to pack exactly what he would eat for wherever we went, if he went to his grandparents or whatever. So I, I completely yeah. understand it, it. It does become a lot of yeah, work. It's very consuming. It's stressful. It's hard. I mean, I have parents who have canceled vacations or they literally pack suitcases like with their child's food um, because that's what you do because you need your kid to eat. And that's not, you know, I'll say it. It's not normal. It doesn't have to be that way. And that's yeah. the more, we wouldn't even call that. I think we do call that picky eating. You sort of said in the beginning, we do, you know, people there would say, oh, my kid is so, so picky. But really at that point, there's something else going on. You know, there's something beneath the surface yeah. because it's not like just that developmental picky eating phase at that point. Right, right. Yeah. And I think uh, it's interesting because when you do read some of the research, you know, there's been parent surveys done and and there was one survey I read that, you know, 63% of the parents surveyed felt like um, 
their concerns about uh, selective eating had not been addressed mm -hmm. by their healthcare provider. Um, and I think that's that's significant. I think that's interesting um, being a healthcare provider because we do tend to sometimes brush that off and say, "Oh, they're going to grow out of it. Oh, just keep just keep introducing those foods, and they're going to mm -hmm. get past it." And sometimes, like you said, there's a little more going on. Um, so, so in terms of that, so it's not just the developmental stage that they're going into, but are there other signs um, or or things that can clue us in as parents that there's something more than just the typical toddler developmental eating stage going on? Yeah, well, I think really it's the, you know, kind of what you're touching upon, <clears throat> like the needing to go to extremes because you know that your child won't eat and there's a concern about what happens there you know to bring it like back to myself for an example if my son doesn't eat dinner or we go out to a restaurant or he's at a birthday party and he doesn't eat the meal it's like okay whatever it was a weird day that's fine he's a toddler you know it's sort of nothing it's fine if for you it's like oh my god like another meal they didn't eat you know that's that's a sign. Or if there is some sort of like anxiety associated with that for your child where they're unable to eat with others because just having the food around or being with others who are eating is so much. Or they know that they're in these situations that are uncomfortable for them all the time and then the anxiety builds. So I see those sorts of, you know, if you're noticing that happening now, kind of at an early stage, it could be a sign that there's more because this developmental phase should not have anxiety with new foods. There is some hesitation about new foods that is developmentally normal as well. And that, you know, can be kind of related to like the poison berries type thing, this neophobia, fear of new things. But it's not like a crippling anxiety. Um, so that is something that can be a red flag for you. Additionally, if you're noticing any you know, even from early, early on and often, you know, especially first time parents only notice this in hindsight, but if there's aversions or strong, you know, aversions for a food group, a texture, you know, getting messy, those can be signs that there's something below the surface that can be interfering with your child's ability to eat comfortably. So a lot of the families I work with say, oh yeah, they never liked to get messy or like they were just never really that interested in eating or, you know, their hands would get dirty with food and they just couldn't handle it. Um, so those would be some signs, you know, or like they only did mushy foods. They never did crunchy or they only did crunchy and never mushy. Those are some signs that like, okay, there's something else happening here and it's not just, you know, a change in their nutritional needs. Right. So, so more along the lines of hypersensitivities yes. to taste, mm -hmm. texture, smell. Um, yeah, I, I can definitely think back to things like that, you know, and, and it does, it gives you pause and yes. hindsight, like maybe yeah. something else. Um, so, you know, for those children or for any child that may just really struggle with the introduction of new foods or the thought of um, trying new things, you know, how many times does, do, do parents really need to repeat you know, offer foods and, and I know we talk about offering foods in different mm -hmm. forms. So not mm -hmm. always a mashed right. potato, maybe a potato, but, but how, how, as from an expert's opinion, like how often do you have to repeatedly um, give that child the exposure to those? new? Foods? Yeah. So this is um, an interesting question because we see this all the time. And so the research um, says around a dozen, but in my experience, you know, or in my experience, it can be more. And because it's also kind of what is an exposure to a new food? What is an introduction? Is it simply meeting it? Is it simply seeing the new food on the table? Or is it a taste introduction? And so I think we're, we're looking at repeated introductions on both of those levels that a child can need to meet a food a dozen or more times, especially, you know, if they're struggling with like, you know, a hypersensitivity or um, some trauma experiences, they'll need to meet that food a number of times. And then the taste acquisition can also take a while too. 
um, you know, the first time, like, and you can probably think about this as an adult, that you can almost train your taste buds. And so it's not that we need to like train our kids and say, you know, oh, it doesn't taste good. Like, let's just really work on it. And you can, but it's more that the first time we try something, it's, it's new, it's different, it's big for our body. And that's anything that we do in life. And so the more that we do something, the more comfortable it becomes. Um, so, you know, I will say a dozen or more introductions and tastes of a new food. And it's different for every food. You know, parents are sometimes like, well, they eat any cookie, any snack. And it's like, yeah, those are designed to taste good. You know, those go through a lot of testing. Our bodies are wired to like sugar and carbs. So um, some foods are harder and same like going back, you know, these bitter foods, they're tricky. Meat, it's tricky. We got a texture and a taste thing going on for both of these. And they're different every time we're seeing them. So you know, patience yeah. and persistence yeah. is what I always say because it can take a while. Yeah. Well, I love, I love your content on Instagram. And so for anyone who is on the call and has not found Jenny's Instagram, I highly recommend you go follow Jenny at feeding picky eaters on Instagram. She's got great content. I love how you show the transition from, you know, something that might be like a chicken nugget to actual mm -hmm. chicken. Um, and it's just a lot of very practical, helpful information. Um, I think it's great tips for this type of thing where you're really trying to introduce different textures and different, um, different foods that are challenging. Um, so other than, um, you know, introducing the food itself, preparing it a different way, are there other tools or other, other things that you have found that really help make that transition easier for children and families? Yeah, definitely. So there's a lot that goes into this, um, you know, and so one of the things is how, just how we're interacting with our kids and if we're pressuring them, requiring them to take bites, it's bad for anybody, that doesn't feel good. You can think about doing that like for your spouse or your friend, like, you need to take that bite, just have it, you know, like you can't order another drink until you finish your broccoli. You know, nobody likes to be told that. So same thing with our kids. Um, but we see in our kids with who, you know, who have more eating anxiety and this makes sense that that sort of coercion can really um, build and backfire. So that's one of the things. And then the other thing that is so, so important is really helping our kids have these positive and like informative food interaction. So it's not just meeting the food at the table where maybe their guard is up and, you know, it's like, no, thank you. If they can be cooking with you in the kitchen or exploring it or using it in some play and, you know, imaginative experiences, these types of experiences can break down some of the boundaries, can help with some of the sensory exposures, help them learn to understand what to expect once they are, you know, ready to eat, once the food goes in their mouth. So anytime that we can create, you know, a positive experience, period, but kind of one of these positive experiences that are also including our five senses or their five senses will help them kind of speed along that exposure process and help them to feel more comfortable and more ready to try on their own so that we don't need to use the pressure or the force. Um, and I know that sometimes it feels yeah. like, oh my God, they're just not going to do it if I don't ask. Um, there are certainly ways <laughs> around that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and as uh, we're talking about this, I'm going to encourage everyone on the call. If you have a question about picky eating, go ahead and drop it in the chat. Um, we will try to get to some of those before the end of the call. Um, but um, so thinking about that, um, thinking about the coer coercion or, or, or what we do in desperate attempts to get our children to eat. Um, are there things that as parents, we should avoid doing that might actually reinforce the picky eating or the, the, the behaviors that we don't want to see when, when it's mealtime. So I guess if you had a list of not to do's, what, what does that look yeah, like? Yeah, it's, you know, this is hard because sometimes they say these things and the parents are like, well, I do this and it works. And it's like, great, then it's working for you and that's okay. Um, but I think just really one of the big no's is anything where it feels like we are 
attempting to control what and how much is going into our kids' bodies, you know, that will often backfire from anyone like my son, you know, who's kind of this more typical picky eater, um, you know, and, and just thinking this morning, like, I think he wasn't that hungry. He was a little cranky, I guess. He wasn't really eating. And if I was like, you have to sit here and finish. You can't go to school. You can't do this. We would have had a huge meltdown. It would certainly back, you know, like we're not getting anywhere. Um, and if there's a kid who like those eggs make them want to gag and you're like, you got to put it in your mouth. That's certainly backfiring. So that tends to be one of my no-nos and that's a no, you know, for most pediatric um, feeding experts who say that, you know, it's our job to provide the food and to provide these regular, you know, kind of structured meal times. It's up to our kids to decide if they're eating and what they're eating. Um, and something that can be helpful because I know this is hard as a parent is just think about, you know, one meal, one bite, like those don't matter. You know, where is one bite getting you? And this one meal, it's one out of many, many, many that they're having over the course of a day and a course of a week. So that one meal is not making or breaking anything by and large. Um, so that could be helpful to keep in mind and sort of to think about looking at your week as a whole instead of, you know, days and meals individually. So that's really kind of my big no. Um, another big thing that I see a lot of parents do, and myself included, um, is that you notice your child rejecting a food once or a certain number of times, and you file it in a way, you file it away as like dislike, not working, done. Um, and I'm so guilty. I was just talking about this this morning. So I'm going to go make this quesadilla that my son has been, you know, rejecting for a while. Um, so he continues to have that exposure. Because if we don't offer these foods, and they're never going to come back to them or have the opportunity to learn to like them. So I want you to continue to expose your child to a variety of foods, including things that it seems like they don't like, or they don't like yet, or they stopped liking. Um, so those are really, I think if we're doing those, those two things, or not doing those two things, um, that will take us really far. And like you said, April, you know, continuing to um, you know, not just offer something like that very particular way because they're so particular. We do want to flex their muscles, their eating muscles and their flexibility with eating. So um, those are kind of the three big things that I would think about in addition to providing, um, you know, or giving them opportunities outside of mealtimes, which is a yes, not a no. So, yeah. Um, I And, you know, when I worked in in the hospital setting as a dietitian, um, working with pediatrics as well, like one thing that I really always thought about, especially after I became a parent too, that I thought was important to stress is just because I didn't like something or I had an issue with a mm -hmm. texture didn't mean that I shouldn't expose yeah. my child to it because his set of preferences, totally. you know, in creating that autonomy of what his likes and his preferences are, um, it was important for him to still be exposed to things, even if I myself mm -hmm. didn't care yeah. for those things. And that's hard because we're the ones cooking and why are you cooking something you don't want to eat? So it is really hard, but, you know, giving them the opportunity, yeah, to find their own way and to, you know, have exposure to all of those different tastes and textures and presentations is so helpful and takes them so far. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so when we think about stress and how that impacts the overall relationship, the, the, um, I guess the back and forth that can occur over meal times, And, you know, I feel like, you know, we sometimes get wrapped up in that. And then, like you said, everything just falls apart. There's a meltdown. How can we take that stress out of the equation? How can we like take a step back, take a deep breath and just approach it differently so that the mealtime is not a source of mm -hmm. angst for everyone yeah. involved? So it is hard. I will say that. And it's especially hard, you know, as parents, like at the end of the day, I mean, for all of us, for the kids too, like you are just done, you know, you don't have a lot of bandwidth left. Um, so I get that it's hard. But that being said, it is so important and it goes so, so far when mealtimes are feeling good. So it's thinking really what, you know, what is your lane as the parent? Where can you, you know, what's kind of the yes and what's the no? The no is forcing our kids. The no is trying to manipulate 
or control what they're eating. So keep that in mind, sort of what your job is. It's the division of responsibility. If that, um, you know, it sounds familiar to you, that's what I'm talking about. Um, and the other thing I think is really, you know, goes back to, you know, trying not to put too much um, pressure or emphasis or weight on any particular meal or food. Our goal for the meal time shouldn't be a certain number of calories or a shirt certain, you know, it should not be food or intake related. The goal of your meal time should be connection. And so when we can go into it that way, that really changes things. And that opens up the door. Like it's crazy, you know, just, and I see it in my own home with my typical picky eater. When we are not focusing on food, when I'm not trying to get him to eat something, when I don't even offer him something, that's when he wants it. When I'm having a good time with food and we're having a good time, that's when he's eating something new. So it's really, um, you know, it is that vibe. It's that low pressure. When we feel stressed, they feel stressed. And then nobody wants to eat because their cortisol's up in that, you know, like it's, it's a physiological thing going on. So having the meals feel good goes far and making it a place everybody wants to be, making meals comfortable. So I have families who, um, you know, have special like mealtime rituals or routine, and it can be simple, just talking about the favorite part of your day or setting the table or putting on some fun music um, or dancing before the meal, whatever it, you know, it can be anything, saying a prayer, that um, can go really far to make a mealtime feel better, you know, when it's feeling tense or help you as the parent take the focus away from yeah. the eating stuff. Yeah. Well, and, and, and right along those lines, I think being very mindful about the experience, about the foods. Um, I, I saw a post of yours recently on Instagram, questions that you can ask that really kind of plays into that mm -hmm. mindfulness, right? Like we want um, them to use their five senses and we want them to, to really get into those cues about what feels good, what's right for their body, what, what they, um, um, really kind of soak in that helps give them that autonomy. So I love that. Um, so what happens though, when picky eating is extreme, when, it does start to impact things like nutrition. Um, you know, what do we do when food's not enough? What do you, um, what are some of your recommendations on, you know, and it, and it can be things done in the short term in the interim. It can be things that are long-term solutions, but um, when we see those extreme cases that really do start to impact our child's nutritional status. What, what yeah, do you it is like, you know, I think that's really the hardest thing as a parent. So you want to be on top of that for sure. Um, and the thing that you don't want to do is go hiding or sneaking. You know, there's definitely some advocates out there who are like, well, I'm going to throw the veggies in their sauce and they're never going to know. They will know. So you want to do this with your child, um, you know, or make small changes. So um, you know, if it's a weight issue, adding things like, um, you know, extra fat, extra, um, you know, just extra volume when you can. I think fat and oil, like a butter, extra oil is a great way to get something in. Um, we have, you can swap, like make room in their beverages is a great way. So we do a lot of smoothies and ice pops here. So instead of using water or juice, like something like a cabrita, something like a milk is a great way to add in some extra nutrition, calories, protein, you know, all those good vitamins and minerals. So you really want to look at what they're already eating and just where you can optimize that. You can also think about adjusting the mealtime schedule. Um, it's counterintuitive, but we think the more that we feed them, the more they'll eat. But kids who graze all day typically don't eat, um, they don't, they're not optimizing their, their nutrition. So we want to kind of stick to set meal and snack times if we can. Um, so it's again, it's, it's really just building on what they have without making these noticeable changes, definitely not hiding things. If you need to see a doctor, a medical professional, go do that. If you think it's a vitamin or a mineral supplementation, usually a multi is fine, but you can certainly check with your doctor and get, you know, some labs drawn. Um, so those are, yeah, some places where you can think about it and just making sure that also the foods that they're eating are really worth their while. So plain crackers, 
not taking you far. Crackers with cheese, you know, taking you further. Um, and that's why, at, you know, subbing something like a milk or a cabrita in for like a just a water or a juice is giving you nutritional value where really there was none. Sure, sure. Well, I, he I hear. Uh, oh, I'm sorry that you can hear that. He's <laughs> far away. But no, no. So I love that. Uh, no. So we'll, we're almost at the end of our time. So I will wrap this up. We do have a question. So uh, I wanted to pose this question to you. Um, it's from Misty and she has a son with uh, food Ooh, allergies. Yeah. So it, it it sounds like he was allergic to milk, casein, and eggs. Um, he was diagnosed at 18 months old. He did pass a baked egg challenge and when he was around three, so he can eat foods that have eggs in them now. He's five and a half, um, and he's he's really struggling to try new foods. Um, and so Missy thinks that it it's because it's related to him being scared um that they'll make him yeah. sick because of his experience do you have any suggestions and 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 i'll say this like go check out jenny's website um jenny friedman nutrition.com and she has great resources on her website um, you can also consult with jenny one-on-one -on -one, um, or she has classes that she offers so certainly sometimes this is not just a quick yeah. fix but but what what yeah. So first of all, Misty, this is really common. Like I, I feel like I get messages like this, you know, once a week at least, um, because your son, it sounds like has learned that food can be dangerous and it's really hard to relearn that. Um, so, or unlearn it. So I think it's really showing, you know, kind of helping him to get that message across. Um, and I think another way that you can, or I think a place that's going to be valuable for you to focus on are these positive food experiences. So um, getting him involved, getting him hands-on can be really helpful for kind of replacing some of those negative experiences with new positive associations. And that can really change his relationship with things. Um, so that would be, you know, I, where I, I think you can focus for sure, you know, and know also that, you know, at kind of his age, it's still in that like picky zone. So he can have some of this, we'll say fear, food fear, layered on top of these normal picky eating, you know, feelings or um, all that's going on there. So it can make it extra tricky at this time. Um, yeah, and I think that's just a good a good starting place. And you can, you know, definitely reach out if you feel like you need more support and go check out my website. But I think those um, areas will be really valuable for you. Yeah, um, and Caroline, Caroline popped in with a question. Um, she said that her toddler really struggles to eat main dishes. So she's asking if she should still move forward with things like dessert, yogurt, or fruit that sometimes she feels like he's just waiting for that favorite part of the meal. Yeah, to show so up. another thing, Caroline, that we like talk about this every single week. So there's a couple of ways, you know, it ultimately comes down to what you feel most comfortable with. Um, but, you know, I think the kind of general trend these days is that we don't say, well, you can only have dessert if you eat so much. Um, because that can actually reinforce, you know, well, the yogurt, the dessert, these are the special foods, you know, you have to behave, you have to do something good in order to earn them. And that, increase, you know, puts them further on the pedestal. So, again, it's up to you. Um, you know, you can certainly focus on, you know, thinking about like, why is he not eating that mean dish? Is it really just because he's holding out for the dessert? Um, or something about that main dish challenging? Is there something that you can do to make it more exciting? Is it getting him involved in making it? Is it doing something like adding seasonings or sprinkles? You know, he can sprinkle on some herbs or some cheese. Does that make it more fun? Um, you know, or even real sprinkles can do the trick sometimes. So you can think about what's standing in his way. And then with families, um, I typically say like have a plan for dessert. And that's what the plan is. So if it's no dessert, if it's only dessert on weekdays or Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or 
you know, it's only fruit, it's only, you know, just have it be something consistent. So nobody is thinking about it. Nobody is like trying to earn it. It's just is what it is. You can limit how much desserts available. That is fine. You can offer yogurt if he's not eating his meal and you want him to get some extra nutrition. That is great. Um, but I think having that expectation set out, thinking about what's standing in his way for the main meal, setting him up for success there is great. Um, I will say the one, or not the one, but something else some families do is offer dessert with the meal. Um, and this can often feel really crazy at first, and like the kids are kind of going, you know, like they're eating dessert first and that's wild. But at some point that can almost like level the playing field a little bit. So it's just another option for you to think about. And I do have, um, if you go to my blog, it's Jenny Friedman Nutrition slash blog, and you can search for dessert. I have a whole um, blog post kind of outlining how to handle this, the different ways you can handle it. Great. Um, I know we did have a number of um, of uh, healthcare providers that also signed up for this Q and A. So I am sharing a resource. Um, this is Jenny's book, um, Stories of Extreme Picky Eating. I will have to say I mm -hmm. I have it. I've been uh, I've been enjoying reading and and just uh, digging into it a little bit. So. Um, anybody who is interested in learning more, um, there's great uh, tips, tricks, and it's just really, I think it's it's helpful to see the examples. I love the case studies that are in here um, because it really helps define and, and, and put some context to picky eating, um, that it looks different for different children and that, um, you know, I think sometimes as healthcare providers, sometimes we just lump everybody in the same bucket and just say, oh, they'll grow out of it. They'll eat when they're hungry enough. Um, and that doesn't always apply to every child every time. So I think it's really important that, um, that we, you know, we consider all of the, the, the things that go into picky eating and all of the challenges that can arise and, uh, and maybe be a little more empathetic to the next time we have a parent say, you know, my kid's really a picky eater and, and try to un uncover that a little bit more, dig, dig a little deeper because that can uh, be a little more serious, I think, than sometimes what we always um, think it means. But um, so that's great. I appreciate the time, Jenny. Um, I always love chatting with you. I think that this has been great for our audience, both for our parents, as well as healthcare providers that have, have joined us today. Um, so I hope people find this resource really valuable to them. Um, and then also, uh, if you have any interest in learning more about goat milk nutrition with Cabrita, um, please visit us at cabritausa.com. And uh, feel free to reach out with any questions directly to me as well. You can contact me at nutrition at cabrita.ca. Um, we look forward to um, hearing from you. And Jenny, thanks so much again yeah, for your time. There will be, a, I'll, I'll just mention, there will be a recording of this because I did see somebody say they had trouble hearing. So we'll we'll be posting a recording as well. So, um, but yeah, thanks so much, Jenny. Thank it's you. been great. Bye. Bye-bye.